what we're endeavouring to do in this, our first session, is to look, take an overview of the UK built environment and sustainable uh, building policy before getting into some of the key topic uh, areas for the inquiry um, in, in this and subsequent sessions on whole life carbon, embodied carbon, the way the planning system influences uh, the, the construction of buildings um, and with permitted development rights and government incentives regarding new build and retrofit of our buildings, uh, which follows our inquiry, uh, which we reported on in March on energy efficiency of existing. And welcome also to Dr. Tia Kansara. Today, I represent the UK's first and oldest community architecture and sustainability firm, Kansara Hack Limited, together with Replenisher, the climate resilience and adaptation consultancy that supports government and businesses on their climate strategy, risk and investment. I'm an economist with a doctorate from the UCL Bartlett on building performance and evaluation. We're keen to implement positive feedback loops to improve the impact of government strategies on the built environment. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Tia, uh, Dr. Kansara, what, um, what, is, what is the best practice that you've witnessed within the construction and the architecture community on considering how sustainability gets built in? And again, sort of the same sort of question as I was asking just now, do, do you think the uh, the community that you, you advise um, have got it and are trying to introduce sustainability and what is it that's holding them back at this point? Yeah, a really fantastic question there. I think on one side, you've got a disaggregation of all of the experience. So the institutional memory that has been um, you know, invested in and subsequently lost um, through decades of feedback analysis on the built environment is, is actually quite striking here. But since about 1992, in terms of best practice, you could have a look at Energy Star in the US and its partners that have helped American families and businesses save up to 5 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity um, and to avoid more than $450 billion in energy costs. These are huge numbers especially when it comes to climate mitigation. Um, this could achieve just for the US something like 4 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas reductions. So imagine what it can do for us both in the domestic and non-domestic building stock. Um, you know, over the lifetime of their program, every dollar of the EPA has spent, um, you know, it has a return of about $350 per, um, you know, business or household for energy savings. So you can only imagine that um, the amount of electricity that we can avoid uh, spending just by virtue of having, um, you know, correct metering, correct data analysis, understanding exactly who is managing the building and where that then is created into a benchmark scheme uh, that can be uh, integrated across all stakeholders. And, you know, the EPA, although they had launched this, has, has set a standard, but it's, um, it's a foundation, very much like the SDGs. It's not one SDG at the cost of the rest. It's using the standards as a foundation. And I think another really good example of this is the National Australian Built Environment Rating System, um, which is a federal government initiative to measure and compare the environmental performance of Australian buildings. Uh, for buildings in use, right? It's one thing to design something. It's an entirely different thing to have it operationally um, match the exact design standards. And what we're finding is that there is a performance gap. Um, so of course, there are rating systems across the world that look at a minimum standard for building performance. Uh, but really our biggest challenge in accelerating this for the UK is investing in our asset upgrades um, by looking at these retrofits like John was mentioning earlier, because these sorts of building energy efficiency acts like they have in um, Australia in 2010 have led to federal government actually requiring most sellers um, of, let's say, non-domestic buildings to disclose a current building energy efficiency efficiency certificate. Now, that's one thing to have, uh, you know, an, an, a kind of a certificate that you can prove the case of. But on a number of occasions in the UK, we've noticed that um, many of these certificates that have been produced and displayed are actually uh, way below in actual fact. So, you know, within a space of, um, you know, 
the next 20 years or so, we've got a huge amount uh, to concentrate on. I think uh, when it comes to sustainability at large, these rating systems are incredibly helpful, but ultimately it's on the government for that end to end wholesome approach. Because if stakeholders are ignoring certain aspects of regulation, then it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So for example, in, um, you know, in, in Sweden, we have um, some really interesting targets that have been introduced. Um, the northernmost territory of Norrbotten is already entirely hydrogen and wind powered. So when it comes to the use of fossil fuels in the built environment, for example, with Denmark, they don't give any planning permission for any buildings that use gas. So I think there are some very stringent opportunities that we can implement, especially for future home developments, uh, where you know, we can develop these in tandem with an ecosystem that supports it. I wanted to come to Dr. Kansara and, and ask a, a question about the, um, the concept of design for deconstruction. I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. I know there's quite often big debates that go on about when you hear that a you know, a rather rundown estate is about to be demolished and, and people are absolutely saying that environmentally that's, that will be a nightmare. Can you, can you just talk a little bit more about, about how you build for deconstruction right from the start? Yes, of course. Basically, this means designing with the end in mind. The UK um, was the first major world economy to pass a net zero emissions target into law. And this target, which was recommended by the Committee on Climate Change, is one of the most ambitious in the world and requires the UK to bring all greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. But the real issue is, as um, Barad Khanna mentions in Connectography, that geography betrays ex existential vulnerability. We can debate about geography, but we cannot debate with nature. Um, and, and what we're kind of realizing with the heightened risk of climate refugees, changing the face of the planet with even more climate disasters, we aren't at a luxury of net zero. Net zero means to make a mess in the first place, uh, clean it up, and then go back to uh, zero impact. We're not for zero impact. That was yesterday. We must implement net positive. This means from design to decommission, the government must take full accountability for what happens. This is a time for radical political leadership and market forces will follow with due incentive structures since you know, the late 1970s. The prevailing worldview has been to leave things to the market. Um, and you know, this results um, with government having no longer the kind of technical capacity themselves, but looks to industry for solutions. But this kind of industrial approach, um, which then owns the building performance, reduces the capacity that the government then has. And I think a key lesson is that a lack of commitment, consistency and continuity in policy and strategy sends mixed signals. Uh, such kind of turbulence for policy instruments is detrimental as this undermines the confidence needed for sustained efforts by multiple stakeholders like investors, owners, management, occupiers, facilities management, right, to improve building performance. And it kind of makes this long term planning absolutely impossible. So there are three kind of key areas I think we can concentrate on. Uh, the first is consolidating the knowledge domain of buildings in use. And I think this is very much pioneered by the Building Use Trust, um, the Usable Building Trust, sorry, uh, with Bill Bordas, which is uh, an authoritative evidence-based uh, practice to inform policymakers, but by way of feedback. So, you know, one of the biggest issues that we have is that the general public is pretty confused by the plethora of methods and policies which lack a common core, including transparency between design and operation. If I'm a client, I have no idea what my building is going to do. I've just paid for it. But it's only in use when the building is handed over, um, you know, by the architects and construction engineers that I'm actually looking at the building and thinking, well, you know, you said you were going to build it like this, but it's actually not like that. Um, you know, and some research that Bureau Happel did on um, a new build of a, of a school showed that by fine tuning a building, you can actually increase the energy efficiency of the building once it's already been constructed. And so there is a huge role in this fine tuning of, of the buildings. Just my final question is to Dr. Kansara. 
we, we've, we've talked a little bit about the housing standards that are coming in here and what's, what's good about them and also what's missing in them. Looking around the world, are there other countries where you can see housing standards that you could recommend that the government could perhaps imp in, incorporate good ideas uh, to uh, add to the future home standard? I think there are a number of really interesting examples across the world. And I think, you know, if you were to take uh, policies and separate them out, you could have a look at the campaigns that the Abu Dhabi government had implemented through WaterWise and PowerWise to start introducing a variety of behavioral standards indoors. I think you've got to try and, and, and see this as a holistic approach. And one of the biggest challenges that we have today is upskilling. So what kind of upskilling methodologies have taken place? So in Australia, um, you know, with NABAs, it has been a really big drive to understand exactly where there is a gap and a skill gap. How can we fulfill um, a reflection, closing the feedback loop and initiating these sort of virtual cycles um, so that we can actually improve on what we've created? And I think what John was saying earlier um, really hits home because this, you know, I think it was the 1960s when the first ever publication came out representing 40% uh, of embodied carbon is within the construction industry. And I think we're still balancing on, on very much the same statistic. And so, so just butting in there for a moment, you've, yes, you've referenced Abu Dhabi, you've referenced Australia. Are there yes. any other uh, standards out there that you think the, the committee would benefit from looking at? I think another standard would be, um, you know, the uh, PAL rating system uh, that has been introduced via Abu Dhabi. I just wanted to give you a name for that. Um, and I did mention the Energy Star. I think that is a very interesting um, example that we can have a look at where there is an implementation from a policy perspective on the housing industry. That, that's great. Thank you. To uh, Tia Kansara, firstly, can you give me your thoughts on how should the government be incentivizing retrofit over new build? That's a really good question. You know, when it comes to retrofit, there are certain cost benefit analyses that can be done. So, um, you know, at, at the at build to put in, say, an air source heat pump, it might cost you, you know, 4,000, 5,000 pounds. But in retrospect, when you retrofit it into the actual building, you're looking at five times the cost of that. So the costing of this kind of technology and or retrofits just primarily depends on each case, each material, each facade. And so, yes, you could do solid wall insulation. Yes, you could look at cavity walls and loft insulations. You can look at other fabric measures. You can look at glazing. You can look at heat controls. I think the, the fastest way to retrofit a building, if I may, is behavior change. So in a number of studies, we found that between 20 and 35% of energy can be reduced inside a building, primarily with use. That means that when you switch the building off, that's the saving. So if you can actually implement these behavioral campaigns, that's your first attempt. Second is to look at the alternatives of retrofitting buildings. So I'm going to conclude uh, the first panel and thank our witnesses, Lord Deben, uh, Emily Hewn, and uh, Tia Kansara for your contributions today.